So, uh, we move to our second paper. Um, okay, introducing Catherine Hansen in the Madison Room. <laughs> How's that for an act of redundancy? <laughs> if you don't know that uh, Catherine's research in Hindi and Urdu makes her one of the leading lights in our field, then you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> in particular, her works, um, her, her innovatively, her innovative work on drama, her books uh, such as Grounds for Play, the Nortanki Theatre of North India, and the Parsi Theatre, its origins and development, are really standard works. To my surprise, I find that the Nortanki book, which I still think of as a recent publication, was actually published 18 years ago. <laughs> so this is the semantics of age again, I guess. <laughs> In fact, I associate Catherine particularly with her even earlier work on the Hindi angelic novelist, Vanishvanath Renu, who Ian is now also working on. Uh, in particular, a fine book of hers of uh, translated short stories. And in 1981, a great favorite of mine, an article called Renu's Regionalism, Language and Form. In some 20 pages, this article gives one of the most comprehensive and yet accessible introductions to any Hindi author anywhere. I don't know if um, Kathy or, for that matter, Mike are pleased by my mentioning articles from sort of relatively ancient history, but at least it, it's proof of their durability. Um, Kathy's scholarly vision sees across the boundaries of language and genre and finds all sorts of exciting comparative approaches. Today, her subject is composite culture and cosmopolitanism in Manzur Ehtesham's Sukha Burger, Erwin Ariga's White Tiger, and Slumdog Millionaire. Well, luckily, I never wrote an article on Age, uh, so. <laughs> but thank you very much, Rupert, for those kind words. And um, in, in uh, the kind of metrical style that we're getting into, I feel um, a need to recollect and reminisce a bit. And my first uh, acquaintance with Herman and his work was in the form of a textbook that came out when I was still a graduate student, which was extraordinary. It had pictures. It had <laughs> cartoons. It had ads. It had film posters. It was revolutionary and very prescient because, of course, now we use all of the visual media of the language and its culture to teach Hindi. But Hermanji was the first one to incorporate that approach. And so in that vein, I thought it would also be appropriate to actually use a Hindi film in my talk and uh, continue the trend of combining cultural studies with Hindi pedagogy, which I think Hermanji uh, rightly introduced. Another thing that um, we get to do on these opportunities is kind of think back about how disciplines change, how fields change, how the space occupied by Hindi has changed in very dramatic ways. Um, it's a global language now. Bollywood is a global medium. Um, Hindi is heard in New York and in Houston and all over the place. And my talk, um, I guess, tries to connect with this new understanding that we might have of Hindi as a global language, um, but also to sort of question, well, what does that mean? Is it a cosmopolitan language? Can it be a cosmopolitan language? Um, what's the connection between the global and the cosmopolitan? Um, and I suppose the third thing that I've always been interested in um, is the political space that language occupies and the way in which the cultural politics of language are inseparable from our interpretation of literature and other kinds of um, texts extending to all manner of oral utterance uh, and all the way up to screen images. So with those questions in mind, I guess, or those kind of points of focus, I'll try to fulfill Sarah's mandate to um, deliver something that's Hindi light um, <laughs> while, <laughs> while also addressing serious issues. So. This paper actually uh, grew out of a workshop that I attended last year at the University of Chicago, and the keynote speaker there um, was an eminent Hindi writer named Mansur Atisham. He was born in Bhopal in 1948 and was educated at Aligarh Muslim University and Malana Azad College of Technology in Bhopal. His published works include five novels, three short story collections, and several plays. 
He received the Padma Shri from the government of India in 2003, and his most acclaimed work, Sukha Bhargad, forms the primary text for this talk. It was first published uh, by Raj Kamal in 1986, and then again uh, it was translated into English and published in 2005 as, as a dying banyan. So this paper primarily engages with uh, the work of Mansur Atisham. The novel Sukha Bhargad by Mansur Atisham opens with an intellectual sparring match between two cousins. On one side is the figure of Parvez, a mature, serious, well-educated cosmopolitan individual. Pror Gampir Paralika or Dunya Jahan Deka Vyakti. Parvez was born in Pakistan. As a young man, he immigrated to the U.S., and at the novel's start, he has come to India to get married. On the other side is Suhail, the protagonist of the story. Like his sister Rashida, who narrates the story, he is the offspring of a secular humanist Vakil father and a pious Orthodox mother. The two children receive their education first at a madarsa and then in a private English medium school, reflecting their parents' divergent outlooks and philosophies. In the course of the novel, Suhail goes on to study engineering, punctuating his college days by several premarital affairs. The most notable is a three-year relationship with a Hindu college girl. Rashida dreams of studying medicine, but in view of her father's penury, she abandons that plan and pursues a master's degree in English literature. Like her brother, she falls in love with a Hindu and has a prolonged affair. Their romantic alliances position Suhail and Rashida on the margins, if not outside the boundaries, of their close-knit network of kin. But these intercommunal romances also locate the two characters within the composite culture, the Ganga Jamani confluence of Hindu and Muslim streams of society. The eventual collapse of these private relationships in the foreground parallels the dissolution of trust between Hindu and Muslim publics and the rise of religious fundamentalisms in the 1970s and 80s looming in the background. The novel appears to lament the withering of the great banyan tree, the Bhargad, symbol of cultural syncretism with its multiple roots. After their father's death, the psyches of both brother and sister fracture. Near the end of the novel, Suhail embraces Islamism and joins the Tablighi, tablighi Jamaat, Rashida comes very close to accepting a marriage proposal from Pakistan. These developments are, however, revealed over the course of the novel as the narrator looks back. To return to the opening scene, Parvez and his cousin Suhail argue the merits of various European thinkers, Sartre, Tolstoy, Pasternak. When Parvez champions Marx over his younger cousin's objections, he wins the debate. The competition between Parvez and Suhail in symbolic terms sets up the contrast be between cosmopolitanism and composite culture that is the focal point of this talk. Both composite culture, represented by Suhail, and cosmopolitanism, represented by Parvez, may be understood as political philosophies that advocate cultural pluralism. Both concepts depend upon an appreciation of and desire for diversity. Both propose public projects and moral positions that move beyond the privileging of a single community. Yet these two stances differ with regard to their genealogies, perspectives, and implications. My objective here is first to delineate the differences between these two. And following this, I will look at a few fictional instanti instantiations of each from current writing. I'm interested in the ways in which these political perspectives are configured in narrative terms. What happens to characters like Suhail and the cos composite culture he inherits? What is the function of Parvez and his cosmopolitan consciousness in Sukha Bhargad? How does the novel enable a contest of philosophies to be articulated and imbued with dramatic power? Several works of recent English language fiction will be drawn into the discussion for comparison. Both Arvind Adiga's novel White Tiger, which won the Man Booker Prize for Fiction in 2008, and Vikas Swarup's novel Q&A, which was the basis for the award-winning film Slumdog Millionaire, are subaltern-centered fictions that further complicate the interplay of composite culture and com cosmopolitanism. So to briefly uh, present some of the background to composite culture, um, outside of...